this first moment to just talk to the Holy Spirit and ask you, Holy Spirit, to speak through me, to help me. You know that I'm not perfect. You know that none of us are, but I am honored that you have decided that you want to speak through me. So help me with the little that I know and, uh, and divide the word that you will speak through me thousands and thousands of ways so that everyone who is hearing right now or hearing right online or even in the future who will go back and listen to this will also have some edification. They will get something spiritually so that they will move forward and higher in the kingdom and develop kingdom mindset so that heaven will be here Amen. wherever we are. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. We Amen. pray. Amen. Amen. Holy Spirit, help me speak. Inside, you can see you see my heart. So I'm like, I've read over this thing a couple of times, but uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> so today, basically, I titled this message Identity in Christ. And if you look all around, it's like that's the message that the Holy Spirit has been hammering in on in this day, in this season. So in this last day, the Holy Spirit is really hammering in on us and our uh, knowing our identity in Christ. So, so this morning when, when we talked about spiritual maturity, I was like, well, all I need to do is say amen and we're done. <laughs> because we, <laughs> amen. Come on. No. So, um, so this topic has uh, been on my mind. I pray that we'll get something else in a different perspective. So I'm going to look at the time and stamp right now in my brain how much I have. <laughs> so I didn't see Christ. It's been on my mind for quite some time now. And, and I've just been thinking, who am I in Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? I know we may have heard um, our families or our friends or our coworkers will say, oh, I'm trying to find myself. Or I just need a moment to find myself. Right, and has anybody heard that before or everybody felt that before? Yeah, right, I need some time to try and find myself. Or let's say we, when we think about, maybe, maybe you're not like that, maybe you're more mature, and I ask you, who are you? And, you, and I'll say, do you know who you are? And you will probably tell me, yeah, I know who I am, right? I know who I am. So, <laughs> so that's why I want to talk about identity because some people don't know who they are. So for those people who were like, oh, I just needed some time to uh, try and find myself. And unless that path of finding themselves includes Christ, then whether they're Christian or not, um, then, or if they're unbelievers, then that path can lead to something dangerous. So as we saw in that drama, we had so many uh, people who they start the race, and this is for the Christians who decide they want to find themselves. So guys, I'm just having a talk, right? Don't you think that would be like? <laughs> so for many Christians who will be uh, like, oh, I have to find myself, and they're like, oh, I want to start this race. Oh wait, let me see. There's a business thing or something on the side that will try and distract them, but that those paths did not include Christ. So you can see that they didn't really meet the mark. And so, praise God, as we're trying to press towards the mark and keep Christ at the center of it all. So why do I want to talk about our identity in Christ? Why is it so heavy? So I sit down, I look at this generation, and I look at my generation, I look at what's going on in the world today, and I just see that so... <laughs> So many people, we're definitely struggling or suffering from identity crisis. So when I look around, I just see that people simply don't know who they are. I'm a new teacher. I decided that maybe I don't want to go teach a medical school. I need to take a brain break. I'm going to go and teach kids in high school. <laughs> so I, that's what I'm doing right now. But in the teacher training, I've learned that we have to accept certain things. And, and we all know what these things are. That's like the elephant in the room that we really don't want to discuss. But there are some things that we can't speak about. We can't openly pray with the kids for things. And I'm just like, oh, God, I don't know if I can do this. Because I can't just keep quiet if somebody is, doesn't know who they are. That's the solution for everything. So I just see that 
the enemy is really trying to use that and capitalize on, on, on this identity crisis to destroy what I see kind of trying to destroy an entire generation. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the point to where as I was, I'm just like, I think I'm going to homeschool my child. <laughs> but um, God will help us that the enemy will not destroy our children with identity confusion in Jesus' Amen. name. Right? So how, I thought about how is this, how are we coming about? How is everybody so confused about who they are? The young people, even the older people don't know who they are. And in case you want to ask a question. And we, our brother talked a little bit about, about how, um, about spiritual maturity. Does it mean that with age? Does it mean that as you're maturing in age, you're mature in Christ? And we kind of got straight to the point and said, no, it's as much as you study the word and as much as you grow and have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, that is how you mature. So how do we have this um, identity crisis? When we look at our, for example, the school, we remove God the Father from the picture. Remove him from our government, from our homes, from our marriages, from our even our own lives. And as we know, God is light. And so when we remove him from all of those areas that are very important, um, they become overwhelmed with darkness and everything that encompasses darkness. Right. So if we look at our, um, what is, I want to have a copy of that, the bulletin. So on the, yeah, may I have a copy of that bulletin, please? Okay, I'll give it back. <laughs> so if we look at today's word on the bulletin, it basically describes what's, what happens when there's darkness. So Second Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And this is not a part of my message. This is just as I am just uh, learning <laughs> and hearing. So it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Even he says they will have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. From such turn away. So these, when I thought about the darkness, it's just right here. These are all results of a world without God, separated um, and just in total darkness. So when I think of the title that we were given to speak on, how do we live in this world as youth right now? I would say we have to know who we are. Because when we look around, there's no way to kind of avoid the fact that it's, there's darkness. The world right now, there's a bunch of darkness in people. And if I just look at America, it's just in itself. I just see the hand of darkness trying to dominate. And so that's why I'm just so passionate right now about this topic, identity, and speaking it to our young kids because um, on the topic of maturity. We don't, once, like say as a baby who comes to Christ and accepts God, the Holy Spirit that that baby gets is not the baby version of the Holy Spirit. It's the full, almighty, all-powerful Holy Spirit. So I just had to mention that since we talked about maturity. But we need, as young people, we say, I have time. In the future, I'll be able to, oh, when I am out of school, when I'm older, when I'm married, I have kids, then I can go and I can talk to people about, no. It starts as soon as you accept Christ into your life. So how do we get, how do we combat that darkness? No, I'm just being led across, away from my message. How do we com uh, combat that darkness is with God, 
is with God. God is a spirit and he lives in us. And we have to, so we have to be sensitive to that and to know, <laughs> to know she's looking at me with like a face like, mm hmm <laughs> So God is a spirit and we have to be sensitive. We have to let him dominate in us. And we have to not be quiet when the Holy Spirit is moving us. So it's really important that when we start, that we, uh, when we start to um, start working for Christ and we get um, a zeal for Christ, it's important that we go out and we speak his word. I'm sorry, I'm kind of going off and I'm trying not to get off of what I want to say because there's so many things here. So um, <laughs> praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So, um, so back on what happens when there's darkness, they have this whole list of things that will happen and we can see that around right now. So when we think about actual darkness, if we were to turn off the lights, we'll notice that we won't be able to see many things. We won't be able to perceive even where things are or even uh, who's whom, unless maybe they're a speaking voice or something. But <laughs> let's say we're in a strange place and we turn off the lights. We don't know what's what, right? There's confusion. And this is a terrible thing because when there's confusion and when people don't know who they are and they don't know how they are to function, we begin to what's called abuse our own selves and abuse others. So we will see, and the word abuse means to go against, like to not use it according to how it was intended to be used. Yeah, ab misused, abuse, correct. So we will see, for example, if we keep it current, if we talk about in the natural bosses and abusing employees or men are abusing women or women abusing men and fathers and mothers abusing children. And we're not just talking about like physical abuse or punching or any of those things or even emotional. It can be just not showing natural affection. That's abusing because that's how God created us, right? So, or lying to them, that's abusing that person, right? You're lying to that person. So, so this is all saddening. It's such a saddening idea that we are, uh, that there's so much confusion right now in the world because we don't know who we are. It indicates that so many people are deficient in the knowledge of God's identity and of his love for each of us. So this topic, I'm going to get into there. It can be preached for years. And so that's why I pray that the Holy Spirit will help me as I speak, uh, go into more of the word that we all will understand. Holy Spirit, let me speak only with a view of Christ and what pleases our Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. All right. So we talked about identity. What is identity? We all know who we are. So we know that there's an enormous security in knowing who you are. Are. And that's the reason that when people have discovered who they are, that's the reason that when there's change, they're kind of reluctant to any change besides what they've already grown into. They're secure in what they know, and whenever there's anything different or anything they don't know, then fear tries to creep in. That's what we see with COVID-19. We didn't know what was going to happen, so people became start to become fearful. So let's see here. <laughs> Now I see how pastors feel when they're speaking and the congregation is just looking at them I'm like, okay, amen. amen. <laughs> so, uh, well, on the note of identity and the importance of the security in identity, it's also a necessity that you know who you have become in the spirit. So 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 15, it tells us, many of us may be able to quote this, right? 2 Corinthians 5, verse, uh, excuse me, verse 17. So you, it basically tells us that you are a new creature in your spirit, right? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. New. So we are a new creature in our spirit. 
So what then, because we, we are three parts, spirit, soul, and, and body. So what then? Well, next we have uh, in Romans 12, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, it tells us that we have to re-educate our minds so that we'll be able to, to think. Excuse me. So we have to re-educate our minds to think. Um, sorry, my notes are throwing me off. <laughs> We have to basically renew our minds. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then verse 2 tells us, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. So, a major part of learning who we are, as I mentioned earlier, is learning who God is. How do we learn who God is? By studying his word. Studying who Christ was, who Christ is, and, and then who we are in Christ. We learn through the word, of course, that we are more than conquerors through Christ, but we won't benefit from all the truth that's there until we begin to really, really get really into ourselves and uh, let's see here, and convince ourselves of it. So this is the condition that the body of Christ has been in. We have. Uh, described it earlier a little bit that we come to know Jesus Christ or come to know of him and then we read one or two scriptures for God to love the world <laughs> that he gave his only begotten son and we cling to that and then we don't study anymore and we try to go we maybe listen to messages and listen to or go to Bible study once in a while and then that's just it. That's how we're trying to survive. But if we were to eat physical food the same way, many of us would not be healthy. We'll have all kinds of illnesses and be sick all the time. So the same way we have to continuously um, be in the word of God so that our spirit man can grow strong to stand against um, wickedness in this dark time. What are some benefits of reading God's word? Besides learning who we are, learning who God is, and then learning who we are, some benefits of reading God's word is we begin to know the truth, right? So we begin to learn all that we have through what Christ has done. And one of Satan's strategies has, uh, against the church has been to keep us in the dark about what we actually have. He is okay if we say, okay, yeah, I'm a Christian. He doesn't mind. He just doesn't want you to walk in all that comes with following Christ. So, and even God tells us in his word in Hosea 4 uh, and 6, he said, my people are destroyed because of yeah, we all know it. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. So I'm not preaching to these people because we all know. We all are growing, right? Is this for the other people? <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> and 2 Peter, uh, verse, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, According to his divine power has he given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that he called us to glory and virtue. So if Satan can keep a Christian ignorant or an unbelief about who they are or who they have become and their rights as a child of the king, then he can keep them in bondage even though the law of liberty in Jesus Christ has been put into effect. So, there are some other points here that I think I'm going to save for another time. But I just want to 
Yeah, I think we're going to have questions and I think it's going to come up. So I want to save that for another time or later today. So if you allow me, let me go here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What did Christ do for us 2,020 years ago? Yeah, he died for us. He died for our sins. Why? <laughs> yeah, so... Yes, to reunite, reunite us with the Father. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not preaching, guys. This is like a, like a talking session with you guys. So, <laughs> Christ died to make it possible for us to have a direct relationship with God Almighty. So, that means... So that means that we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for someone else to speak or to pray on our behalf. We can go directly to the Father. When we see we have a friend who is in need of hearing God's word, we can go directly to the Father and ask him to help us, to tell us what we are to do, who we are to help, how we are to play our part here now. And it said, we are seated with Christ, right, in heavenly places. So in our spirit, we are seated with Christ. That means in heavenly places, that means we have all that Christ has in heaven. So wherever we are, and we know that we are ambassadors of Christ. So wherever we are, heaven has to be. We stand and we represent all that heaven represents. So... I pray that we will study God's word so we know all the laws. Pastor said he's he's really zealous, uh, has a real zeal for law and and every and judge, what is that, jurisdiction and everything. So um, I pray that as we study the word, we will learn how things operate, how to connect the two so that wherever we are, heaven will be. So there are so many scriptures that will go with this. And like I said, this is a topic that has to be dealt with over time. So I pray that God will help us and we will continue to study Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is our time here on earth? What is, what is our time here on earth all about? How should we spend it? <laughs> so I'm asking you guys the questions, right? Okay, so the time that we have here on earth in this day, as I mentioned, it's all about learning as much as we can about what Christ has done and spreading that good news to others who don't know it. And it's about being bold and spreading that light that comes with Christ, that comes with God who lives inside of us. There's a song, you know, that we all know this song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. Well, I'm just telling you that the light that you have is far from little. So I pray that as we learn uh, more about who Christ is, who God is, and I know that this is not covering who all, all who Christ is, but <laughs> I pray that we all study. So I'm just admonishing us to learn more about who we are and do an intense study in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. <laughs> so as we continuously uh, study the word and spend time with the word, we'll be able to grow and be able to walk in the spirit. So we'll be able to discern those areas of darkness that each of us were put here to address and to bring light to. Another benefit of studying the word is that we have continuous revelation. It's not a one-time revelation as we, you know, when we first came to Christ, as I mentioned but it's continuous. God wants to be a part of every single part of our lives. 
and there's always more to learn about him because God is inexhaustible. So, the Holy Spirit is telling me that we're going to address all these things and we should ask, I should wait for the question session. So he's telling me that I should wait for the question session and then, um, and we're going to address some of the points that are here. So my prayer point for everyone here right now, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, and put a break on it so that Emily can come up and speak. Yeah. <laughs> and my prayer point, and I even pray this with my daughter, is, Father, help me to know you and to show you more and to shine in the dark areas of this world, wherever I am. Amen. Amen. Wow, thank you very much. See, as she was speaking, I was just nodding my head and saying, wow, the Holy Spirit, you're amazing. I know that whatever we, what she has shared is what the Holy Spirit want us to share with you guys. Because, like I said, we prepared independent of each other. I didn't know what she was preparing, and she did not know what I was preparing. And when I was started preparing, I was talking about, I was going through, I was going at, at, the, at the direction, but after some point, the Holy Spirit brought me back into what I have to share with us. And you know what, it's just the exact same thing that she has just shared with you guys. So I am just going to do more of an elaboration of what she has said so please, pardon me, if you are going to be hearing the same things that she has said, it's the Holy Spirit that is reiterating. You know, he wants somebody sitting here to get this. So we want to thank God. When I was preparing, he didn't give me a title. So I just went ahead and wrote down, you know, what the Holy Spirit put in my mind. And since she has a title, Identity in Christ, so that is my title too, <laughs> because it's just a continuation. So, what is expected of youth in a time like this and in a society we are living in today? So, um, there's no doubt that, that when the issue of expectations from youth is raised, that, you know, we always think in the direction of, you know, having a dream, Studying hard in school to make good grades, you know, getting scholarships, doing internships, you know, getting a great job, you know, starting our own business, making good choices and decisions, getting married, buy a house and some cars, live well, get children and raise them, save up some money for retirement and have a fulfilled life. I mean, when I started, this was the direction I was going. I had really almost a full page because when I study, the Holy Spirit drops words into my heart and I write it down. And then when I share, that's basically what I, what I share. So when I was writing all this down and the Holy Spirit kind of let me know that this is not exactly what he wants me to share at this time. And, you know, when you think about it, we are talking about youths and we are talking about how we are expected to live in a time like this. You know, the Holy Spirit told me that those things are not, it's not the things that makes us different from the world because that's the exact same thing that the world is chasing after. So for us, in order to be able to address what is expected of us, we have to address it from the angle, from the perspective of who we are because that is what sets us apart. So when we live our lives and chase the same thing the unbelievers are chasing, then there's nothing that makes us different. So today I'm just going, you know, I'm just going to buttress what um, my wife has talked about. So to address the issue of what is expected of youth in a time like this, we need to understand the kind of world that we are living in today. So I have here, the book of um, 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5 and that is what she just read where Paul was talking to Timothy, was telling him 
how in the last days is going to be. So I'm not going to read it again because of time, but if I am to summarize everything that Paul has said in that verse, in that um, verses 1 and 5, 1 to 5, is all about selfishness. So when you look at the world today, you understand that everything that is happening, you know, everything that is happening in the world today is driven by some kind of selfishness. So, in a world that we are living in, where everybody cares for themselves, you know, everything that everyone is doing is just a way to manipulate the other in order to better him or herself, his or herself. So, and also, if you look at, you know, in the world that we are today, you'll find out that there are, things are changing. You know, the way things are changing is changing so fast that no one person can keep up with it. And then, there are so many people that are lost, you know, in this world. They, they, they don't know where they are going. They don't have an identity. They don't have a direction that they are going. So, if you read the news, if you watch movies, there are some ideas that have been projected to us. You know, there are some conceptions, you know, things that you might not know it, but they are enforcing it upon us. And unconsciously, these ideas and notions are sticking yep. and it's causing people to be confused. You know, they don't know which direction to go. They don't know which way or which ideas or things to believe in. But for us as Christians, it's not supposed to be so because we are not people of this world. So, what is expected of youths? Or I should say, what's expected of everyone? So I have here, it is to have a genuine relationship with God by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Know who you have become or who you are if you have already received Jesus Christ into your heart. Receive, okay, through the word of God and by the help of the Holy Spirit. And then live life in a manner that is consistent with who you are. So the main reason for God to create us, for God creating us, is for us to have a relationship with Him. That is one of the main reasons why. He, that is the reason why He created us. You know, when I was reading the book of Genesis, I was thinking to myself, if God created everything and He created man in His own image. And then he gave us everything that he had created. He gave it to us. He wanted us to have dominion over everything. That means that he values before he even created us. He had thought about us. He had thought about how he wanted us to be. And he created us in his own image. And then gave us everything. So you see that God wanted us to have a relationship with him before he even created us. So that's why I say that that our expectation is to have a genuine relationship with God. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that is where the Bible says that, you know, that God created everything and everything he created, you know, he gave the authority to man. And in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, if you read verses 4 and 5, please, can you put it up on the screen? Because when I read this, it kind of took me back. Initially, when I read it, I wasn't understanding it. I just read it and go through. But there was a time I was studying, and the Lord explained this particular. I think we were actually having a Bible study together, and the Lord expanded this particular verse to us. And it made much sense to me then. It says here, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but you can also read from this. It says, even before he made the world, you know, when I read, even before he made the world, it doesn't make sense because this is Paul speaking. How does he know even before God made the world? He says, even before he there is God, he made the world. He loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. So that means that before God created man, man is not an afterthought. It's not something that he created every other thing and then thought, oh, let's create man. No, man was, if you ask me, I would say man was the goal of God's creation. See, Paul was speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here. He said that God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. So that means that even before God made the world, his plan was that he would create man that he will adopt man into his own family through Jesus Christ. So that means that 
the work that Jesus Christ has done, that has been the plan of God. Although it wasn't God's intention, he, he didn't want us to go astray, but his initial intention was that he would adopt us to be his own family. So Paul said that, that this is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So God desired relationship with us, every one of us, even before he created man, and it gave him pleasure that he wants to do that. So, if you go home, study the book of Ephesians, start from verse 3. If you read down to 14, just study the Holy Spirit to open your mind to so many great things packed in this particular verse. So, God already has an intention for us before he started his creation. So, when man walked away from God, when man disobeyed, to become that when we walk away, when we refuse to be part of God's family, and after you receive Jesus Christ into your heart and believe He is the Son of God who has paid for the penalty for your sins, He reconciled you to the Father, putting you back in God's original plan, which is being part of His family. And can we open to Romans chapter 8, verse 17? I think there it says that. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So what that place is saying is that when we receive Jesus Christ, because God desires that we have a relationship with him, when we accept Jesus Christ, we become, we are restored back to God's original plan, which is being part of his family. So, and that is confirmed here that in this book of Romans chapter 8 verse 17, if you, if you read a couple of verses back, you will see this was Paul talking about when you receive Christ, what happened? He says here that we are joint heirs of God, that we are heirs of God. Heir means children. So we are children of God and joint heir. So joint heir means that we are brother, Jesus Christ and I and you are brothers, are heirs to God. So what I'm trying to bring out here is that God values the relationship. So what is expected of you is number one, you have to go back into God's plan. You have to establish that relationship. So that is very important. If you have already established that relationship, awesome, that's great. Then what is the next thing? The next thing is that you have to study. You have to study and know who you are. That is very important because if you don't know who you are, then you, 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 you lose your identity. Even though there was a place the Bible was talking about, the Bible was saying something, say that even that a child doesn't know that he is a king, a child of a king doesn't know is just the same as a servant. I don't have that Bible verse, but you know, there was a place that the Bible says that a child is not different from, from a servant until he grows up, when he grows up and knows that he is not a servant, that he is a prince or a child of a king, then he begins to live like him. So for us, we need to begin to learn who we are, who we have become, and how can we know that? We can only know by studying the Word of God. It is by studying the Word of God that we will be able to uncover who we are, that we'll be able to understand what God has done, what Jesus Christ has done for us. So getting to know who we are in Christ requires studying. Studying the Bible that contains the Word of God. So there is no shortcut. There is no shortcut to this. What someone tells you from the Bible about who you are is not sufficient. But when you study, when we study ourselves, we give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to do his work. So the Bible says that in Ephesians, I believe in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, it's part of the verse that I said we should read, we should study when we get to it. say, when we believed, we were given the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is serving as a guarantee of God's promise that we are God's people, that we are God's children. And the Holy Spirit was not just given to us just as a symbol. He has a responsibility. His work is to help us to walk in the way, to help us to live as who we, we have become. So when we study the Word of God, the Holy Spirit swings into action. The Holy Spirit begins to expand. You might read a particular verse of the Bible. The Holy Spirit will now use that verse of the Bible to begin to you know, expand so many things onto you to begin to tell you so many things. See, the writers of the Bible, they were inspired by God to write. But you know what? It was the Holy Spirit that inspired them to write. And that same Holy Spirit is living in anyone that has received Jesus Christ. 
So when you read a particular verse, the Holy Spirit will give you the full detail, the full meaning of what, of what he meant when he inspired those that wrote. So what am I trying to say here? You have to study, every one of us, if you receive Jesus Christ, if you have been reconciled with the Father, you have to understand your rights and privileges. You have to understand what your identity is. Because if you miss it, then you are not different. Even though you have received Jesus Christ, you know, you have been adopted, but you are not going to benefit from what comes with it. So that's why it's important that we study. So you can think of this as if someone goes out there and buys something, maybe you bought a smartphone, and you only use it to make calls. See, you have the phone, you are able to make calls, but it's not going to serve you as when you are using it to its full potential. So, every child of God has the Holy Spirit, whether you know it or not, because it is a symbol of assurance that we are the children of God. So when we spend time studying the Bible, we activate the Holy Spirit to walk. And through the verse or chapter we are studying, the Holy Spirit provides revelations and insight into what we are studying and also reveal things to us that are not directly from what we are studying. See, um, Jesus Christ said that when the Holy Spirit has come, that he will reveal things from the Father to us. So remember, we are talking about what are our expectations. But in order for us to be able to live up to these expectations, you have to have a relationship with God. You have to know who you are. And then the next thing is that you have to live like it. So it's not enough that you have a relationship with God. It's not enough that you know you have to live like it. So I'm trying to rush through what I have because of time so that we'll be able to you know, talk about ask questions and be able to talk about other things. Maybe go back to the initial, um, the initial message I was putting together. So, when we spend time and study the Word, the Holy Spirit gives us revelation of who we are and how we are to live our lives. So we are supposed to live our lives as such. So in times like this, in these present days, we cannot afford not to know and live as God wants us to. So when the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, you have a conviction of what the Holy Spirit showed you, and in turn, it's easier to live or put to work what you have learned. This is very important. The preacher or the pastor can stand and say some things to you or preach the word to you. These words he's speaking to you, he might be speaking with so much conviction, he will be speaking with so much conviction and power as the Holy Spirit has revealed to him as he's studying. But you know what? To you that is listening, it might not have the same effect that he had when he was studying, when the Holy Spirit was expanding the, the, the passage of the Bible, when he was prepared. But you know what? When you yourself, when you invest your time to study, it doesn't matter the passage of the Bible. When you study, you and the Holy Spirit you know, teaches you, you have more conviction. That is when you know yourself about what the particular verse is talking about. At that time, you will not need to be persuaded. You will not need to be pushed or cajoled in order to, you know, live like who you have become or live up to your identity. So, the church today is filled with Christians that lack conviction in who they are and what the Bible says about them. However, this is not supposed to be so, and that is the truth. So many people, they can tell you God's promises. They can tell you about you know, what God expects from us, from what, you know what? They don't have conviction in it, and they don't live like it, especially in times like this. You know, in this time of COVID, I have sat back to kind of think, when Jesus Christ was performing his miracles, he was touching the lepros. He was, you know, he did not care what manner of disease the people had because he knows that he himself cannot be sick. It's like he has that, or he knows that 100%. So there is nothing like, oh, you know, let me not touch him so that I don't get sick myself, but let me pray for him from afar. No. You know, things like this, when you yourself, you understand this, 
you have a conviction in yourself that if I am a child of God, if I have the life of God in me, that means I cannot be sick. It doesn't matter what is happening. It doesn't matter what's happening in the environment. It's not going to impact me. So when the Bible says to us, when we read John chapter 3 verse 16, that God so loved the world, and we read Ephesians chapter 1, 4 and 5, where we have read, and, you know, do we look at ourselves with full assurance that God loves us? You know, do you have that conviction as you're sitting down here that God loves you? Because if you do, that will affect, that will impact your way of life. You know, a lot of people, they might not tell you, but when they look at themselves, they don't like what they see. When they look at themselves, you know, they see the other person. They prefer how that person looks. But you know what? If you understand that God loves you, that means so much. It doesn't matter what, you know, you look like. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. When you know, when you read the Bible and you know that God loves you, you should be convinced in it. Also, the Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's in Romans chapter 3, verse 22. So it says that we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So are you convinced in your heart that you are no longer a sinner before God? That is very important because that will also impact the way we approach God. It will also impact our lives, especially in this time. So how about... When the Bible says that we are rich, regardless of what our prophet says, do we believe that in our heart that we are rich, that Jesus Christ was made poor so that we will be rich? Do we believe that? So how about when the Bible says that we have divine healing? That's in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. It says, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Do we, believe, do we live you know, knowing in ourselves that sickness is not our portion? Even when you feel headache, if you have the conviction that you cannot be sick, that, that, that pain will disappear, that headache will disappear. And another thing is that, how about our existence does not end here on earth? Do we live our lives as such that we, we are going somewhere, that our lives doesn't end here? That after our time, after our journey here on earth, that we are going to continue in heaven. Do we live our lives as such? Because when you know yourself, when you know that you are a child of God and that the earth here is not your home, it, it helps you even in your day-to-day -day life, the way you deal with people, the way you do things. And also, what about that we will receive a reward in heaven? And that is in Colossians chapter 3, 23 to 24. Say, so walk willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as a reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. Do we invest ourselves in the work of God? Do we invest ourselves in whatever we do, you know, even when we reach out to people? Do we do it with all our hearts, knowing that we are going to receive a reward, we are going to receive something from God? So as youths, as everyone, you know, as men and women, child, sitting here, it's very, very important. It's very important because we have to be different from the world. If we don't have a, a separate mentality, a mentality that transcends this world, then our life, we will not live to the fullest. That car that you want to ride, you know, those things that you want to do, those things will not set you apart. It will make you different. We have to remember that we are a chosen generation. That's what the Bible says. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a chosen, that we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That means that we are light. We are light. The Bible says in Matthew, I believe Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus Christ is talking, that we are the light of the world. And we are the light of the world because we are now part of God's family. And we study the word, we understand, we know, and we live like it, whatever we are. The light that we have should be seen. When people see you, they should be able to see the light of God, the light of Jesus Christ, reflect from you. And that is from how you converse with people, how you deal with people, 
you know, how you deal with your family and everything in between, how you hold your conversations. People should be able to see you and understand that you are different wherever you are. So I've just run through what I have, you know, but I know that I pray that the Holy Spirit will expand this word unto us. You know, I, in our various homes, when we, when we sit down to study, I know because that is the work of the Holy Spirit to help us understand who we are, to help us expand, to help us understand what the Bible is, to help us understand who we are. So the Lord will help us, you know, as we study the word, as we, you know, study the word to have a conviction, to know who we are. The Lord will help us to live like it because that is very important. You have to live in a way, you have to live in a way that, that you know that you are a child of God that you are part of God's family, that God wants to have a relationship with you and that you have a relationship with him. And that will impact, you know, the way you fellowship, the way you pray, the way you do things. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Always remember that you are the light of this world. You are the light of this world and you have to shine. You have to shine because if you don't shine, then there is no difference between you and the unbeliever. Even though you are saved, but you might be sitting close to an unbeliever and somebody will come in and spend some time with both of you and can't tell who you are and can't tell if you are a Christian or not. So the Lord will help us as we study the Bible, as you know, we know more of who we are. And if we don't have a relationship, this is very important. This is a time that we cannot joke around with who we with you know having a relationship with God. Because just like Paul said. That in the last days, all things, all things, if you read past verse 5 and keep going down, that was where Paul was telling Peter and um, telling Timothy, say that you must, can you give us, can you pull up um, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's see verse 6, I just want to read that, and then not verse 6, let's read verse 10, verse 10. So, from King, I'm reading from King James. It says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch. Antioch. That is not what I'm looking for. Let me see if I change it to New Living Translation. Let me see if that has. Say, but you, Timothy, carefully know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from them all. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. Okay, yeah, this is where I'm looking for, verse 14. It says, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you can know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Jesus Christ. And it went on to say that all scriptures is given by all scriptures and inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and what make and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. So at this time, and I'm going to call uh, my wife. And also, if you have any question, if there's anything you want to ask, if you have any question, maybe it's not related to what we have talked about here, you, know, you can ask us. By the grace of God, we will answer as much as God gives us grace. So at this time, we are going to open up the floor you know, for people, you know, for you guys to ask us questions. Don't look at me or my wife when you ask your questions because if you look at us you'll be deterred from asking your questions you know just know that you know that the holy spirit is going to talk is going to speak 
through us, Amen. not just Amen. us. So Amen. at this time, okay, yeah. do okay. Yeah. So yeah, a, a little bit about what you're saying is that this time that we're coming together is for us to sharpen each other. The time, the purpose of us meeting together is to sharpen each other and encourage each other and help each other grow. Okay. All right, so we have some questions here. A couple of them are directed to me. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, how, Sister Nancy, how did you cope with uh, being a child of God, getting married uh, as a Christian, and also pursuing a PhD degree? Hmm. If you would have heard me when I graduated, I was like, this is Christ PhD. This is Jesus Christ PhD, it's not Nancy PhD. <laughs> because there were, I, let me just answer the question. I heavily, 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 heavily relied on the Holy Spirit. Heavily relied on the Holy Spirit. I can't stress that word enough. Heavily relied on the Holy Spirit. I said, God, there was so, if you look, if I share the testimony of how I completed this PhD, and I thank you for, maybe I'm supposed to share it, that's why this particular question was sent out. But um, I wanted to quit that PhD. There were so many different, different obstacles that made me say, you know what, I don't think I wanna do this. And with the things that I'd done, like, oh, I didn't study for that test. <laughs> the things that I, have, I had done, other people tried and they were kicked out of the program, but I was not. And so I, I told you that every step of the way that we walk, we have to walk it with the mind of God. Like, God, you are before me. My only prayer was, God, what is it that you want me to do? So he led me towards PhD. Because my original plan, I wanted to go for MD and go be a heart surgeon. <laughs> and then, you know, so he led me towards PhD as I, he kept like open, God will open your eyes as well. So he opened my eyes to where I need to be. And then at one point, I'm just like, are you sure this is where you want me to be? Because there were so many obstacles and everything, like from, like, there was so many things, <laughs> like racism and all these things, like, I was, <laughs> a professor failed me just because, yeah, there were so many things from one of the classes. So if you get a B minus, it's a fail, basically. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. But I heavily relied on the Holy Spirit for everything. There were so many things, there were so many voices that would say, oh, well, you're not good enough to do this, or you can't do this, or you're not smart enough to do that. No, no. I was like, to what kind of advice would you give to her would you want her to go through it before she get married or in the process if there's an opportunity for her to get married yeah that's a good know? question yeah that's a good question mm. as god leads as god leads yeah because i don't have a prescription i'm not god okay. but the thing mm. the thing is that as god leads my own plan was written out i would go to school mm. finish school and i was i even said to god myself i told him what I was going to do at one point. I was like, God, you know what? I know that you, I know that, you know, I have a plan. I want to be married and I want to have kids, but I'm going to go to school first because I don't think I have time. So, can I ask the question? Did, mm -hmm. did, did the marriage deter you? Did you no. Did you at any point regret why pursuing the career that, oh, if I had known I would have been married by now, mm -hmm. if I had known I, sh I shouldn't have been raising kids now, you know, mm -hmm. do you at any time have such little regret? If I would not have been married to this man, okay, okay. if I would not have been married to this man during this PhD time, there would be no PhD. <laughs> I'm just going to say that because the Holy Spirit is up. So that's why I say as God guides, it's really crucial that it's as 
God guides. So yeah. don't you think? Yeah. So in addition to what she has said, I think I believe that whatever the whatever you want to do, you can do it. It doesn't matter. You know, I I know that you're asking her opinion, but to you, just know that whatever you want to do, you can do it. You can accomplish it if you really want to do it. I know the Holy Spirit will help you accomplish it, find a way to make it work. For us, we decided while she's in school that we're not going to have a baby, you know, so that to make her work easier. We got married in 2013, and we had a baby last year. 2019. So we we're almost six years in our marriage before we have a child. Oh, great. Holy Spirit, please. It was our decision. You know, we decided. I mean, we could have had a baby, you know, if we wanted, but the way the Lord leads us, the way we wanted to was to wait until she's done with school. Mm. And by the grace of God, it worked out for us. I had, you know, we have our baby, and it's amazing. We thank God for that. So, whatever you choose to do, I believe you can do it. It doesn't matter. You can always do it. As long as you set your heart to it, that is part of who we are. You know, if we have this mentality that you can do anything that you want to do, you know, you can always achieve it. So, that's what I Don't mind. We, we want to suck everything out from you guys. Okay. But I did have a couple of questions here. Okay. Are, are we fluent now? We now know that we, we could plan, we, we could arrange things, we could even agree and say we want to do this first. And Present it to God. He yes, help. And, mm -hmm. and again, you said something like I think your husband was a great positive voice in helping you achieving your dream. Yes. So, can I ask you a question? How did you commit? How did you know it was your husband? <laughs> All right, okay. can I? Mm. You want to yeah, can I? Can I? Can I? Okay. <laughs> well, then he has his own part too. <laughs> so, Right after I told God that I didn't, I was going to get married after school. And I was like, okay, <laughs> if, and I was like, I also prescribed how I want to meet my husband. I was like, well, let me meet him as a friend first because, you know, I was what, 18 or so, or maybe 19. I was like, let me meet him as a friend first because so many guys, they can put on a mask and they can pretend to be whoever for a while and you don't know. <laughs> and I was just like, I was like, at one point he said, okay, that's fine. Whatever you say, Nancy. <laughs> but tell me who, how do you want him to be? And I was like, well, and this was the Holy Spirit helping me at that time. I was like, well, let me be, let him be strong in the areas where I'm weak. And let me be strong in the areas where he's weak. And the only way we can know this is if we're friends first, I'm telling God how it's going to happen. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, now you've heard my whole list of all these things that I want after the Holy Spirit told me to, to tell him all the things that I wanted. And I was like, and let him be a man after your own heart. And you have to give me the evidence, God, because you know sometimes I can miss, <laughs> I can miss something if you yelled it and rolled it out in front of me. So you have to be very clear <laughs> about it. So there were some things that I had prayed specifically as well. And when this guy came along, <laughs> when he came along and we, we met, I had no intentions of like dating. And I definitely did not want to date an, an African <laughs> because of all the stigmas that come with it. Okay. And yeah. yeah. So initially you didn't have all the specifics you had written down? Well, I thought my husband was going to be white. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk for that, please? <laughs> I also told God that I'm, I don't want any <laughs> because of what I had seen. So I had already told God what I wanted because I was like, okay, this must be different. But God has something better in store. Yeah, He gave me what I needed, right? So He gave me what you needed from what you want. Yeah, yeah, but I thought I wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, guys, this is a note. So I also wrote deep voice. Hi. <laughs> I love his voice, but I'm just giving an example of how we might have things prescribed and how we want things to be. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, go ahead. For me, when I was back home in Nigeria, I had always dreamed, I always wanted to get married when I'm 27 because my dad got married when he was 27. So I've always prayed to get married at 27. 
But before I left Nigeria, I was 23. And before I left, I had already been making plans of who I'm going to marry, you know, who I'm going to contact and get married to. And that is true. So, but you know what? When I came to the United States and when I came to, especially met her, and I turned 27, and I realized that although I'm making my own plans, that God might be making his own plans too. So, when I met Nancy, actually, at the time, I... I never thought about, I wasn't thinking about, you know, women at the time. I wasn't thinking about, you know, getting married or anything. I met her as a friend, but as we got to know each other, the Lord began to minister to me all the things that I have, you know, my clients, you know, my wife, and when I get, when I'm 27, and the Lord began to talk to me. It's like, although I might have my own plans, although I have, but he has a plan for him to bring me here. Maybe there's something that he has here for me. So that's how I started, you know, opening up. Because initially, she's just a friend. We had a couple of classes together, and we talk, and we go. But then, that was in 2011, that was when I met her. But throughout 2012, I never spoke to her. And this is the truth. Throughout 2012, because I wanted to be sure that, you know, <laughs> that this is my wife. I wanted to be sure that, you know, that I'm not trying to get married because of something that something is pushing me to do it. And I wanted to know who she was, who she is, if I'm not in the picture. So by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I was able to, you know, after a while in 2013, we were able to come back together and we spent some time together. We talked about marriage and everything worked out well. And, really, and I really want to give God the praise that I married her, you know, that we are together because she has been a very great support for me as well in areas where I am very, very weak. She is very, very strong. In the areas that she is weak, I am strong. And by the grace of God, not that we don't have challenges, especially because of our background differences, we do. But by the grace of God, God has been seeing us through that. So I want to give God praise for that. Yes. And please, let's just you know, rush through the question that we have here. So this one says, how do you cope with being pointed out as different? Because our uh, light is shining and it disturbs or affects the people around you because they feel uncomfortable, which makes you feel you are an outcast. In summary, how do you deal with this kind of feeling in people? Okay, that's okay. Now, number one thing that I want to say is that you have to understand that you are different from the get go. You are completely different. See, the Bible says that we are a, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That is who you are. If you understand that you are different from the world, I think that will help you deal with this. You understand that you are different. You're a child of God, that you are the light. Now, your light, light does good. If you look at, you know, the impact of light from any angle, light does good. You know, when there's light, people can see. When there's light, you know, it kind of gives way for other things to happen. So for you as a light, you should not be feeling bad for who you are. It doesn't matter if you are different. It's okay. It's okay. In fact, people should see, people should know that you are different when they look at you. In fact, after spending five minutes with you, people should be able to tell that you are different, that you're a child of God. So don't feel bad about it. It's not, you don't have to be apologetic because you are a child of God. You are to represent God. And you have light in you and you shine that light regardless of the situation. If you're making somebody uncomfortable, then that is a pointer to you that you should start reaching out to that person. Because the plan of God is that every one of us will come, will develop, will have a relationship with him and become the light. So if somebody is uncomfortable around you, then you know that you have some work to do. You, know, you have to reach out to the person and let them know about Jesus Christ. So, that is my answer to this, by the way. Yeah, that's awesome. I just have a little contribution to that. Also, so we do address feeling because we all are feeling, we're all human beings, we do have feelings. And it never feels good when we, um, uh, when somebody rejects what we have to say. And that's in any sentence. But I just want you to know, especially when we talk about Christ, when it comes to talking about Christ, you know, we, we, don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? 
but unseen forces and all those things, right? We all know that scripture. It's a spiritual battle with spiritual peoples. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. So whenever we want to talk about Christ, you can expect that in this, the darkness, the dark powers that, try to, that are trying to rule this earth right now, they will fight back. So it comes with knowing who, yeah, it comes with knowing who you are. So I would ask that you continue to study, get with people so you can really, really grow in who Christ is and who you are. Thereby know who you are. You can walk confidently. Amen. So because of time, we'll just um, run through some of these questions. But I have a very powerful question, a very wonderful question here that I wanted us to take a look at. It says, why do some unbelievers prosper more than Christians? So there's a couple of questions. There's three questions. So this is the first one. Why do some unbelievers prosper more than Christians? Number one, you have to understand that in Christ, we have everything that pertains to life and godliness. You know, just like when we read that Jesus Christ was made poor so that through his poverty we might be made rich, the material things that unbelievers have cannot equate to what we have as Christians. You know, when you try to measure your pocket and try to use that to tell if God loves you or if you are rich in Christ, then you are missing the mark because the blessings that we have, it transcends it transcends this physical world. It transcends the life that we are living here on earth. Yes, God wants us to be comfortable. He wants us to have everything that we want here on earth. He wants us. But the thing is that as much as you have God's promise, you have God's blessings, you have to be doing something. And when you are doing something and, you know, God will bless you as much as he wants to. It's not that you can't ride all the cars in the world. You can, but the truth is that the fact that an unbeliever has something should not move you. It shouldn't shake you. God blessing, God is blessing me. God is blessing me, you know, in every way. And I'm very, very comfortable. And I know that God will keep blessing me. So yeah. for you, I want you to know that when you look at all the things that they have, the unbelievers have, just know that those things will amount to nothing. You know, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was telling the disciples that everything that you see, you know, that they will all be destroyed. Those those will be left. And even David said that he was almost moved, you know, when he saw the unrighteous prosper. But God, if you read, I will find out verse, but if you search for it, you will see it. The Bible says that in that place that Paul, um, David was writing, he also said that he just waited a little bit and he saw that their destruction was so much, you know. So when an unbeliever prospers, it shouldn't bother you so much. Know that what you have is greater. Life doesn't end here. You have so much blessings, you know, more. Even in heaven. The second question says, Can we miss God's plan for our life? If we miss it during our youth or a certain phase in our life, can we recover it or what can we do? Very, very, very important question. So here is what I have to say, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to us individually on this, on what the right answer here is. But this is what I have to say. We, we, cannot miss God's plan. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior, then it doesn't matter what you think you have lost. You are still part of God's plan. So you, the main thing is that you only miss God's plan if you don't have a relationship with Him. And also it says, if we miss it during our youth or certain phase. So when you talk about plan, I, I presume that the question is referring to maybe um, if, if you miss certain things in life. Maybe you didn't go to school when you're supposed to go to school, or you don't have a job when others have a job. Maybe if it's something related to that, we serve a God that he can he can recover everything that he thinks we can lost, that we think we've lost. Mm -hmm. And I can give you an example. When I was back home in Nigeria, I graduated from secondary school when I was 18. And between 18 and 24 years, that was six years, I, was, I wasn't in school, I wasn't doing anything. I was working towards getting my admission. And at the time, all my mates, you know, people around me, they've all moved on, got into college, and everybody, some of them, got in their job. But you know what? I trusted God. And today, I'm doing far much better. I'm doing far much better than what we have achieved. So as a child of God, you cannot, you, you will not miss what God has for you. Amen. You know, it might be in the later time, 
might be in the early, but whenever you develop your relationship with God and stand by it, God will always make you. If you trust God, that's why I say you have to be convinced of it. You have to convince convinced that that your plans, that God, you will not miss it. So, and the last question I'll say, can God use his sovereignty to accomplish his plan in our lives, irrespective of what we do? Amazing question. Can God use his sovereignty? No. That is the truth, because he gave us free will. And the fact that he gave us free will means that he will not override, he will not override our choices. Very, very important. God will not override our choices. So, he has, he has, he has put things in place to help us, stay us in the right direction. If you don't know God, you know, if, let's say for an unbeliever, there are preachers out there preaching for us, for people to have a relationship with God. But if you already have a relationship with God, and, you know, God will always, God will always make ways for you. He will always lead you in the right direction, but he will not override the choices that you have made. Regardless of the fact that he's a, he's a sovereign God. So I hope that helps answer this question. Maybe we can talk about this some more, you know, after this. It all boils down to knowing your, who you are and becoming more confident. They said we have um, faith, right? That faith, just a quick note, is God's own faith, right? A part of the, the armor of God. That faith is God's own faith. So God has a, God's faith is like this. God believes that what he says has already been done. It will come to pass, right? It's already done once he says it. That's why he never calls us by all of our mistakes and all these things. He calls us, he gives us a new name and calls us by that, right? So we have that type of faith. I just want to mention that. So as we grow, the only way we can grow in that type of faith is if we learn more about God through his Holy Spirit. Only way we can grow in God's type of faith is if we study more about God, who God is, and then we learn who we are. Right? So that's just another thing. And Pastor, just one thing that I wanted to say is that, the one thing I wanted to say is that when you know who you are in Christ, there is nothing that you want to achieve here on earth that you cannot achieve. There is nothing. You have to be convinced about what you want. And if you have the right, if you, if you have received Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit and you spend time and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and you have a relationship with him, Everything that you do has to prosper because that is God's promise. Even though there might be some difficulties, but you know what? It's working out for something greater. So I just want to encourage you, if you are here and you think that you're having a hard time, if you are here and you think things are not working, number one, you have to be convinced of God's promises for you and know that God has, he has promised. You know, all the promises of God, he wants us to enjoy it here on earth and then, and then in heaven as well. So nothing is stopping you from making your plans. Don't let anything stop you from making your plans. Don't let anything stop you from reaching forward you know, for, to your goals. Still go ahead. Go ahead and make plans. And by the, by the help of the Holy Spirit, you will achieve everything that you want in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. When you come across people who are sold up to God, you always know them. They came this morning from Kansas City. They were here. I, I got.